please join us in welcoming CEO of Dubai Airport, Paul Griffiths. CEO of Kersner, Philip Zuber. Chief Commercial Officer of Emirates Airline, Adnan Qazim. And CEO of Dubai Corporation for Tourism and Commerce Marketing, Islam Qazim. In conversation with Skift founder and CEO, Rafat Ali. So, Isam, sit. I'm, I'm going to sit here, and then the rest of you can sit uh, okay. here. Where please, and then sit here, please. The other way around. Yes. Oh, Philippe, come here, please. Oh, one of you. <laughs> okay. So, um, thank you, Paul. That was um, amazing. Thank you. Um, you've set the stage. You've set the rallying cry for. Uh, I think all of I think you were hinting to all your colleagues with with this message as well that obviously Dubai what the miracle of Dubai in terms of of, of what it's become um, is there from your perspective and since you 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 said the thing small is beautiful a, a phrase that you said which we love as a, as a small company um, in this tourism ecosystem that Dubai has built, where do we find the small? <laughs> well, I think the thing is, it's not so much about small, perhaps. Perhaps it's about intimacy. intimacy right. And I think the difficulty is when companies gain scale, they often lose intimacy. And I think what we've been able to achieve here, particularly in the tourism sector, and Adnan next to me from Emirates, I'm sure, will comment later, um, is that actually we've maintained intimacy with scale. And that's my fear for the future, because I think a lot of people will look at things and think about technological efficiency and think about scale, but they'll forget about the key thing. And technology is there to enable people to have a better experience, not to be there to make more money for shareholders necessarily. Mm -hmm. And I think retaining that ability to regard everyone as an individual and to scale intimacy, I think, is the, the secret. Um, Isam, obviously, the, the vision for Dubai 2031 is to double from 20 to 40 million uh, the visitors that you have. So um, how are you thinking about what, what that linearity will be from 20 to 40? And what do you think the industry that's here with you, the industry that's here, uh, what do they need to do to help you with from that 20 to 40? I think when His Highness Sheikh Mohammed uh, announced the vision that was for, for the UAE to reach 40 million tourists by 2031, right? And we know that the major share of that would be from Dubai. I mean, at the end of the day, this is what, what we know. This is the industry that, that is most familiar to us. Um, and Are people I think able to hear? Uh, just, I want to just... Is, is, or do we need to raise the levels? We're good? Okay, sorry, go ahead. So I think when you look at it from that perspective, what's unique about Dubai is the way that we work together as an industry. Right? Dubai has always thought as one Dubai Inc. And uh, that's why I think for us to reach our goals, it's not us planning it in isolation, us mapping it out in isolation, or, or mandating it, right? It's more of a conversation that happens amongst all of us across the industry and understanding exactly what Emirates' growth plans are, what the airport's growth plans are, what Kersner's growth plans are, and how we can make sure that this vision, before it's announced, it's fully aligned and it's realistic. And what we then do is we make sure that we plan it out in a way in accordance, and then as you saw the city briefing that we, we had earlier today, that we're regularly maintaining that conversation and dialogue, showing them the gate, showing them the monitoring on how these progress, uh, progressions taking place, and where are the opportunities, and where, what are we missing out on? Because, like you said, maybe having that small solution in a, in a, in a, in a, in a big space or an airport making, making it smaller, but yet being able to achieve the numbers that we're talking about. If you think about it from, from a geographical and, and a physical presence, Dubai actually is quite small. Right. But the amount of things that you can do here is second to none. And the fact that it's so convenient and everything is so close by, you have a much more fulfilling itinerary during your stay because you're spending less time commuting. So I think for us, when we look at it as a product, going back to the Dubai Inc. approach, 
We think about it from the minute that they get on an airplane, let's say on an Emirates airline, as soon as they land into the airport, all the way through from the taxi to the hotel. Everything has to be seamless, and every single touch point has to be at the standard that I was talking about, the 9 and 10 satisfaction scale. Right. That's where we want every single experience of Dubai to be. Adnan, so from, from Emirates' perspective, obviously, you have to build. One of the things that Dubai has done, which I think has set the template for the whole world, is build it and they will come. You know, this is what is said in tech in general, and you took that philosophy of build in ahead of the demand, and that's really what has happened for Dubai as a, as a, as a city, and then obviously all of you here that are, that are sitting here. So in terms of Emirates, in terms of airlift, like how are you thinking about, um, one, a lot of the challenges that Paul talked about, the seamlessness of the whole, whole experience, but also how do you build from here uh, in terms of airlift, in terms of planes, et cetera? I mean, as far as we're concerned, um, the capacity, uh, reintroducing the capacity back from the COVID, I think, is key. Being a global airline with 140 destinations, uh, we really were quite busy in putting the capacity back to where we left it uh, pre-COVID. Uh, so far, we have managed to recover almost 95% of the network, which is 143 destinations. We have managed even from the capacity side, totality, to bring in 80% back uh, from where we left it. Uh, and that, to be honest, I mean, one of the key success of Dubai today is the speed, I think, that we, we put the capacity back to many places uh, with help of the government, with help of the stakeholders, I think, We're that we worked We're showing your in. network here. Um, I think that really gave it the advantage. Dubai got the advantage because Dubai wasn't left out of the accessibility during the COVID time. Uh, I mean, we reach almost now to 3,000 departures uh, per week, uh, which is, I mean, in terms of the scale, the 380s and 777 that we operate, it's quite big. Uh, and for us, the, the mapping, uh, the way it's coming as a way forward, is to go back to 100% uh, recovery by hopefully next, next year. And that's the aim that we have. Uh, once we're back to the 100%, I mean, we left COVID, we were close to 60 million passengers. That kind of, I mean, the side that we reach, and, and uh, as Assam said, uh, Dubai, uh, Emirates played a vital role in contributing to Dubai success, bringing more tourists, uh, and, and that's where I think we stand today. I mean, uh, a lot of work is going on between uh, the two domains in terms of how to tackle uh, the new markets, new segments, new opportunities. Uh, life is not the same thing in terms of uh, the, the, the movement. I mean, we don't have yet China. Right. Uh, which is, again, is a big pocket, I think, of movement that's not there anymore. But do we wait for China to come back? I mean, one of the things that uh, was quite successful, I think, and, and because of Dubai being the frontier and the whole thing, uh, Dubai managed to get tourists from the uh, United States, for example, right. and in a big number. Uh, we are seeing Canadians coming to Dubai. A lot of these new pockets that's coming in, because we didn't wait for that time to come in. Uh, once China will come in, that's a top up which uh, what Assam said, I think, but, uh, but yes, I think the city all about the speed, about agility, the, the way we respond to things, and we're working toward that uh, and, and putting the airline back to 100% uh, hopefully by, by next year. Okay. All right. Philippe, you're the um, private sector here compared to all three of you here. And so, um, or at least pure private sector. And uh, as you look at Kersner, very much a Dubai-based company now. You sort of reinvented the company uh, over the last many, many, many years now. Um, what does Dubai mean to you as a, as a private operator and then how you, radiate out, uh, you, how you radiate out from here as you build in different parts of the world? So Dubai is a global uh, organization, so we have assets all around the world, but obviously we have a very, very strong presence in Dubai. Our global office is in Dubai. But Dubai has absolutely no equivalent. As a, a hospitality company, what makes the difference in Dubai is that absolutely everything is made for us to focus in our business, meaning the entire experiences is driven to ease the guests to arrive to a hotel, that when they are at the hotel, they can, we as an organization can focus on delivering the brand experiences, focused on the quality, and really focusing on the experiences. There is absolutely uh, no equivalent that we don't have to stress about 
airlines, airports, transports, facility to the city, event that the city has to offer. But more over that is the collaborations in order to achieve that the experience for the guest is really at the top. So I think what is remarkable about Dubai is the fact that we have been able to deliver these emotional experiences to the guest, that they've seen Dubai as a destination that they will come back and not taking as a kind of a first time to experiences. This we have seen that extremely strongly in our resorts, that the life becoming so easy and so comfortable. Mm -hmm. And it is clear that our job as hotelier is to focus on the details. And what Dubai gives us as an opportunity is that we have the chance and the opportunity to focus on the details. And the detail makes the difference today because guests are extremely sophisticated, have lots of expectation when it comes to ultra luxury experiences. So Dubai is the best place because it's allow us to do that. Um, just continuing on a, a little bit on your company, obviously you operate at the super luxury end of, of, of the market and uh, clearly um, that has held up very well uh, during the pandemic as in fact probably leading the recovery uh, early on as well as continues to be very, very, very strong. So, um, uh, and, and, you, and you're now launching obviously beyond the Atlantis and one and only this new brand Zero as well as Rare Finds uh, as well. Seer, I thought, was very interesting uh, because it's for hardcore fitness, and you talked about the fitness challenge for Dubai as well. So talk a little bit about, um, I guess they're showing your properties in the back. Um, Seer, I, I thought, was very interesting. So just give a quick sense of what the plan for that is. So Cyro is our oh, new Cyro, sorry. Cyro is our new innovative uh, brand, which uh, we're so excited about it because it's really respond to now a need uh, post-COVID. I mean, it's a brand that we had been working pre-COVID, but uh, suddenly it's becoming a kind of an accelerated brand based on the demand. So Cyro is a very innovative brand which is based into lifestyle fitness. The basic principle is um, guests back home, they have the habits, they have uh, their routine when it comes to fitness, and whenever they travel, it's becoming an issue. And more forever now, uh, in a post-COVID time, we have realized how many people have really found it comfortable at home to really being able to do the healthy habits because they know the coach, they know the therapist, they know a uh, practitioner, they know anyone which creating that their fitness environment is at the best. Whatever they travel, they cannot really sustain this practice anymore. So Cyro is the brand that will guarantee because we will be focusing on five pillars. One is fitness, so it will be the best of the fitness element with an incredible gym and incredible facilities. The second element is recovery, which will guarantee that instead of having a typical classical spa, you will be able to go into an environment that will facilitate your recovery after a fitness experiences. The third element is really, really important, is mindfulness. So it's everything to do with mindfulness, meditation, stress management that will be within one space that will be guaranteed towards classes, towards different time on the day that you will be able to go to those moments in order to continue your fitness routine, to enhance it and to really benefit from expert uh, support. The fourth element is about sleep. As hotelier, we have forgotten a little bit the importance of sleeping. Mm -hmm. So we have made a lot of works. We think of the mattresses. We have built a brand new, one of a kind, new type of mattresses that control your body temperature. The whole room's environment will be designed to really guarantee a comfortable sleep. And more than that, the whole ecosystem around that will be extremely uh, focusing on that element. And the fifth point is about nutrition. So it will be chefs which will be cooking superfood, but in a very, very innovative matters. All of those elements bring together into a hospitality environment will bring it the fitness lifestyle into a new journey. And to give us credibility as a brand, as a customer, we are partner with AC Milan. So we have access to all of the players, all of the therapists, all of the sleep therapists, uh, doctors, which giving us the really, really professional content to have credibility into the space. And then two uh, incredible as well uh, sports individuals uh, 
which are part of CSIRO teams and helping us to really uh, understanding how to expand uh, your you, 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 you body capacity and uh, be the best version of yourself. Can you come to my apartment in New York? <laughs> it seems like that's what we need there. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Paul, so um, uh, the, the quest, uh, why do you, you were talking about we, the invention of uh, the putting, not invention, putting the wheels in the suitcases? Why do airports still have carpets? Because when they put the wheels, the problem you know, with um, that is like the... the, the I, I've, often, I've often wanted to make one of those wristbands which, for my team, which says, um, let's make carpet history. Uh, because I have to say, in high circulation areas, I just don't think they work at all. They smell if you don't right. keep them clean. And if you are 24-7 operation, it's impossible to keep them clean. You have to replace them. They provide rolling resistance to my beloved wheels on a suitcase. Right. I have to say, carpet has its place. It has its place to make a space feel luxurious. Right. So seat. in a seating area or a lounge area, then in a high traffic area where lots of people have to move quickly, they are a nightmare. And I don't want to call out um, a PDX, certain airport PDX in PDX Southeast Asia, <laughs> which uh, loves its brown carpet. I think those who travel through this hub, which is sort of slightly south of Malaysia, will know where I mean. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, has, it has an absolute mass of brown carpet throughout it. Now, now the good thing is it's quite quiet because it deadens the mm -hmm. sound. Right. But it's hard to keep clean. It does smell. And it's, I, I'm talking now generically about carpet, no, <laughs> not about the airport in question. So, um, but I, I do think you make a serious point that carpet and airports needs to reconsider its relationship, I think. So, but uh, but th there's this um, serious point that I was actually trying to think through, which is uh, the first time traveler, hmm. which Dubai, you can imagine airport, airline, uh, Dubai, the city itself, um, we always think about sophisticated travelers. But for, for you to go to 20 to 40, there's going to be a lot of first time travelers. Hmm. People that have never boarded a plane before, people that have uh, never been to an airport before, people that have never been to, an, uh, for lack of a better word, an overwhelming city like Dubai. Uh, like Dubai. Um, quickly, Paul, and then I'll come to you, Isam and Adnan as well. Um, how are you thinking about the customer experience? In the quest for tech, are we, are we losing this whole, um, will we lose something? The thing is, you see, tech is meant to serve people. People are not meant to serve the tech. And where tech intervenes to make a process more complex, more difficult to navigate, and less intuitive, the tech, to me, is failing. What we need to do is recognize, a bit like fire, we are the masters of tech. If tech becomes the masters of us, then it's a problem. Oh, tech is becoming the master of us. Don't, don't worry exactly. about that. that is exactly. So happening. what needs to happen here is we need to design the tech from the perspective of that first-time traveler that you described. And my vision is to make all of the tech completely invisible so you don't see check-in, you don't see anything to do with your baggage that's all dealt with before you even start your journey to the airport. And you should just simply arrive in a hospitality environment and be met by people. Because tech should facilitate those moments of truth where it's people serving people. So that first time traveler will feel comfort and familiarity with something they'd never seen before because they'll be guided by a real person. And the tech makes that easy. That, that to me, is the vision. And I think one thing that I was very pleased to hear Issam comment on earlier that all three of us are involved in is this first-time stopover journey because mm. I'm sure everyone will share this experience where you've hosted someone from overseas and they'd never been to Dubai before within a day, ask them how their experience has been compared to their expectation. In fact, half of our team, this is the first time they're visiting Dubai. Ex exactly. And people's expectation of what they 
think they're going to experience is so totally different. Right. And it's universally positive because what Dubai offers the world is so incredible because of this homogenous way that we work together to create that experience. And I, I think the stopover package and that first time experience in Dubai for new travelers, I think if we can keep doing what we do, keep it intimate, keep the tech serving us, not getting in the way, right. then people will want to come here as they have been doing for, for decades now. You see, I'm hardly thinking about curation, because I guess, and what you announced this morning, I was, I was hearing very closely, a lot of new things that you're announcing for a first-time traveler or even a repeat traveler. I guess curation has become such an important thing, meaning content and presentation of it becomes uh, very important. You're very good at it as well. So how do you think about curation to stop this overwhelm if people do feel it as a traveler? I think for us, there's, there's a few things. So when you look at what tech can offer is um, algorithmic approach to, to targeting, right? To understand exactly what people are consuming and making sure they were presenting the right message at the right time. And again, because we have the luxury, and it's a problem, but it's a luxury of so many things that Dubai does well. And how do you make sure that you pick the right ones and not you know, do an overkill of, of, of information at the same time? So finding that balance is, is important. So tech can play a key role in making sure that that happens and also tracking behavior post that that leads to search and hopefully conversion as well. And I think, again, as, as Paul said, it's, tech is supposed to serve the client so we remove the, the annoyances, of, I would say, of travel so you can enjoy the experience of that hospitality side, right? And I think when we launched the Dubai College for Tourism, it was one of the parts was to bridge that gap. So even other touch points when it comes to the cab ride and so on and so forth, they also understand that, that culture of, of service as well, as much as hotels do and, and, and airlines and airports and so on. Then you have the repeat visitors. Repeat visitors have a different approach. If you're looking at the near proximity, right, so within four hour radius, you've got about one third of the world's population, right? Mm -hmm. So they're at your doorstep. Which is what Emirates has built their whole business. And then when you look at the eight hours, which is still a comfortable flight, you have two thirds of the world's population. So a lot of these people can frequently visit Dubai, even for weekends to attend events or to attend a concert. So for them, the treatment should be very different. It's like going to another city within the same country. So for them to come into Dubai, it should be so seamless and it's just about offering them the right opportunity to come in and not really again engaging with the whole uh, process of going through check-ins and, 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 and uh, security and scrutiny and this and that. So if we can make, remove all of those hurdles out of the way, which again, if one thing we know about Dubai, nothing's impossible, right? So if we can be the trendsetters and really change the game and do that, we know for a fact that people will be coming to Dubai. Already we have 25% of the visitors who come to Dubai from our statistics, 25% of them are repeat visitors. And by repeat, I mean repeat in 12 months, which is very, very high compared to anywhere else in the world. So we still feel that the potential for that to grow is much bigger. We have 80%, if not more, of the population are uh, people who have chosen Dubai to be home. So they play an immense role in attracting VFR, right. visiting friends and relatives. It's always been big in this part of the world. 100%. So all of that, as it, it, just, it just feeds in perfectly to making sure that if we can remove these kind of hurdles, use technology to put the right offers in there, whether it's for a first-time traveler or for the, 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 the uh, repeat visitor, we need to understand at which point of the funnel within that journey they sit and serve them the, the solution that way. Adnan, from your perspective, um, easing the anxieties of travelers, particularly if they're coming to Dubai for the first time, and in general as well, airlines, how much do you think about easing the anxieties of travelers in general as an, as an airline? Well, I think uh, for me, if I look at um, the COVID, it was a classic example in terms of how the journey became more seamless. Uh, we learned a lot and we adopt a lot of things. I think as part of the change, I think that we brought into our DNA of how we conduct the business. Uh, part of it was the, the B2C channel, the, the, the online platform. Uh, today, we're generating almost 50% of, uh, of the revenue that's coming is coming from that channel, which is quite, which is quite a seamless. Uh, and I'm talking here, the entire the OTAs plus the, the EK online, I think, together plus the retail shop that we have. Uh, that took away a lot of these kind of, the, the hurdles I think that may come in the way. Uh, that's one, we adopted a lot of these 
technologies, the biometrics uh, sort of for chicken. Uh, uh, we we uh, even came in with a collecting baggage from home, I mean, a day before, uh, as part of the, the services that, that we offered. Is that, the, is that, that we now? offered it to first class, but today, Donata, for example, okay. have that through the dupe uh, company. They do that service uh, where you can, you can hand over your baggages a day before and you go seamlessly to the airport. Uh, so I think, and, and even immigration, as, as Assam, I think, alluded to, that uh, when they travel today, they, they travel seamlessly. I mean, they don't, honestly, you don't need to take your passport out with a smart gate or the tunnel gate, I think, that they have. Uh, they all take away, I think, that sort of, uh, in terms of how the, the, the technology being adopted to the system, I think, it's mm -hmm. happening. Uh, it's, ha it's happening quite a bit in terms of uh, how we're driving the business today. Um, so I think, I think, and through uh, the, the technology and through the, the, the website that we have, you can really push so many things. Uh, and part of that push would be in promoting Dubai as a destination because you have really a lot of uh, visitors coming to your, to your web, which you have the full control over the situation, I think, in terms of promoting the destination as well. I just have a personal, personally curious question. Has the issue of Wi-Fi on the planes in long haul routes been solved? Well, that's uh, beyond, I think... Uh, this is the most important question because, because, of the whole panel, by the way. <laughs> uh, the problem with Wi-Fi, I think they're coming with a third party uh, dependency, and sometimes I think you link with many zones that you fly, and they are restricted zone in terms of getting the right Wi-Fi or the speed that you, you want. Part of it to do with the technology itself which is evolving and is not at that speed. And, and for us, maybe another challenge, maybe we have, unlike maybe so many airlines, uh, if you travel with a low-cost carrier from uh, a point maybe in UK to a regional point two hours with 100 passengers, the speed of the Wi-Fi and the capacity of the Wi-Fi will be much, much uh, faster right. compared to a 380, where you have 517 and they all want to get access to full Wi-Fi. Uh, it's not easy, I think, but uh, as we progress, as we see a better technology is available in terms of the Wi-Fi speed uh, that will, and, and we're adopting that. I mean, uh, we have few aircraft that came in with the, with the speed, but need to go through a complete revamp as we progress uh, as well in this uh, domain. So the answer is no, not yet. <laughs> uh, it's, it's beyond us, I think. I think uh, we're doing our best effort to make it uh, at speed, I think, that passengers expect to get. Uh, but it's challenging, and it's not easy. It's not easy. And yeah. work is still in progress, I think, to get into that level, I think. Get into yeah, that. Uh, Philly, from a seamlessness perspective, obviously, you're, at the, as, as, as we talked about, on the luxury end of things. Seamlessness has to be, like, there's no other option but to be seamless for your, for your customers, correct? And so how much are you thinking about the balance between humans that have to be present when, when they're really needed versus tech, that's part of it. So in the ultra luxury sectors, like uh, for the one and onlys, uh, we're still extremely relying on the human interactions. And we're making as a main point to remain extremely strong on that space. We are a brand which are focusing on human interactions, and we want to make it as much as possible um, the most seamless experiences and the less that the guest has to interact it with uh, the machine and the technology. We're making a kind of a basic statement is that most of our hotels are resorts and we do not want to have automated curtain. We want the guests to be able to open the curtain and to enjoy the view. And we don't want the guests to go starting to look for a kind of a remote control and try to find because it's becoming such a kind of a natural element when you are on vacation in your beautiful suite or villa to go enjoy the view, enjoy the terrace, and being able to access in the way you want. So we are all about technology when it comes to the back end, the back of the house. Mm -hmm. We have invested millions to ease the process. And for us, technology is a process to ease our colleagues to do a better job and giving them more time to interact with the guest. So we are really, really investing on how to automate it, the back of the house, the uniform delivery, and many, many of those back-end process. And, and that actually works very, very well. But a funny story as well, we have tried in a few resorts to automate it, uh, the uniforms rooms. So now we have automated in order that we don't have uh, our colleagues to have to carry too many 
very, very uh, heavy uh, uniforms to carry. But we have bring back human presence because this is the time that you need someone to say good morning, how are you? Mm. How is the weather today? So it is valid for our guests, but it's valid for our colleagues as well. What we are really, really into it is, um, and, and that's something that our guests and obviously you all here are really looking for, is the guest preferences. Right. You know? So we are capturing uh, the like, the dislikes when it comes to food. Because how annoying it is to every day in the morning to say, you know, I'm vegan, I'm vegetarian, I'm gluten-free, non-gluten-free, like this. So we are capturing the guest preferences from a food standpoint in order to give them a much more comfortable journey towards long stay. Um, we're, we have about five minutes. I have a couple of uh, questions. One, Isam, for you. Um, and then I have a big, bigger picture question about Middle East in general, th this whole region, MENA region, and what what the moment is today for this, for this whole region. Uh, one is you've used celebrities very effectively. Shah Rukh Khan from India, I mean, that obviously is a huge driver for you. Um, you've learned, I'm sure, lessons on using celebrities to market a destination. Uh, give some of the top lessons that, that, that you've learned on using celebrities and your approach, your continued approach to it. Sure, I think, again, each campaign and each uh, protagonist or, or, or character or celebrity or KOL that we would use would have to serve a certain purpose. So with the Shah Rukh Khan one uh, and the others that we chose. Everybody here knows Shah Rukh Khan, right? No? <laughs> the Americans probably don't know. He only happens to be the biggest star on the planet, at least by the volume of people that care about him. But actually, that's a good point. And that is exactly why we went with Shah Rukh Khan, because he is far more global um, from, from his own personal perspective as well as from Bollywood perspective as well. So it doesn't just cater to India, but more of a Bollywood fans, fan base as well as the Shah Rukh Khan fan base. And the additional layer, of course, of being the fact that he already is familiar with Dubai, and Dubai is somewhere that he frequently visits. And that was important because you can see that resonate and come through, as opposed to a transactional uh, deal with, uh, with somebody who's going to come in and just act it out. And mind you, he's a great actor, he could still act it out. But, um, but what I mean is, it's important to get the right character that represents the product, right? And truly believes in the product. And then when we went with the Jessica uh, Beale and Zac Efron one, that served a different purpose because we wanted to create a hype. Um, bring in, again, two personalities. One is about, like, let's say, the, from an environmental perspective, health uh, and well being and so on. And the other one, more of a, again, through fitness and through a business uh, woman and, and, and uh, also being a mother at the same time. And so, so many values that represents the kind of demographics that, that we, we uh, seek. And having them create almost like a movie trailer side was to create a dialogue and generate conversation and again, get the search uh, lift up. So for us, there is a purpose and a place to use these um, uh, celebrities and the KOLs, but then it's about what we do with it post their campaigns. So they're usually used on an upper layer of the funnel on the awareness side. Right. But whenever we move into the consideration side of things, we then personalize that by market and by segment and go into niche audiences within profiles that are relevant to them. And in some cases, they might not be TV personalities or movie personalities, right. but they might be business people or, or individuals who have a following that can continue that message in a much more relevant and a much more relatable way. So, so it's all about the whole journey as opposed to just one-off hit. Because if you do that, it's going to be a very costly one and doesn't necessarily bring in the, the benefits of, of what you're we, actually after. Um, we've discussed, can we add five minutes to the clock, please, Brian? Can we just add five more minutes, sorry. Um, we've discussed leisure a lot, but I mean, Dubai is obviously not just a leisure. This conference is an example yes. of, of a not leisure um, tourism here. And so uh, in terms of what the industry calls mice, but meetings and events, et cetera, uh, importance of business traveler. Um, one, what is your sense of the recovery of the business traveler, all three of you? Um, because there, there was obviously tons of discussion, as you said, about business travel being lost, or, or at least X percent of business travel being lost forever. So what's, what's your sense of what the recovery of business travel for Dubai is and the importance of it? Uh, in terms of recovery, I think it's incredibly important because, you know, a significant part of the business here, as Issam and Adnan know only too well, um, is actually related to events like today. And that's 
incredibly important. Because of, we've got this fantastic global position, we are a really good hub for business travel here. You know, three-quarters of the world's, two-thirds of the world's population within eight hours flying time makes it very accessible. But I think, again, the, the myth of, oh, no one's going to travel for business anymore, accountants will force us to sit in front of screens to interact, I think, again, that's a misrepresentation of what technology has enabled. I think what it will do is the same as the invention of email over regular post. Uh, what we've seen with video conferencing, it has actually accelerated the rate at which we do business. Hasn't given us more leisure time, and I'm sure right. we're all testament to that. So if it's accelerated the rate of business, and say we're doing three to four times the number of transactions we were doing before, we might travel less per transaction, but there are more transactions. So I think the technology has increased the speed, but we will maintain the frequency. So I'm quite confident that the reasons to travel, we've all learned during COVID the limitations of video conferencing. You can't read body language that easily. You can't really negotiate a difficult deal. You can't establish a true rapport, but you can have eight people on the screen and discuss a transaction. Right. So uh, most business deals are a combination of those okay. things. Okay. So we will still be traveling for business and that will remain an incredibly important segment for Dubai. Let's just, just to add to that, let's not forget at the tail end of 2020, we started Expo, right? Right. Uh, of, of, sorry, 2021. So we were looking at that period of time when people were saying that maybe we should postpone it by another year. But Dubai, Dubai took a confident step and said, no, we're going we're gonna to start it. And we did. And we had a very successful event. We had over 24 million visits. And, and the whole city came together to really celebrate that moment. And it's not just, again, like the campaigns I was mentioning earlier. Even that as a platform for six months, having those people over there, decision makers there, Dubai capitalized on it by creating a lot more business opportunities off the back of Expo, which we're now still reaping in the benefits of. Right. So those are the kind of things that we're leveraging. And I truly agree with Paul because when the first travel trade um, event took place was ATM, the Arabian Travel Market. And prior to the lockdown, everyone was talking about how business of events and meetings is dying, everything is going to go online. But the minute we opened up, if people could physically hug, if they were allowed to, they would, right? But I think COVID restrictions still didn't allow for that. But everyone wanted to have that physical interaction. They wanted to have those face-to-face -face meetings. And it was clear that a hybrid model would be a solution for those who, for valid reasons, couldn't come in. But it will not replace the physical meetings and physical events. And then from your perspective, the, re the recovery of business travel? I mean, the, the kind of, I think, the, the premium demand that we have seen uh, last couple of years, we haven't seen it, I mean, maybe in the company history. Uh, particularly, I think, when I look at it from the demand on F&J, which is somehow, I think, linked to the business travelers. I mean, it, it, we have really achieved the record occupancy on our first class and our business class, and that's quite reflecting kind of demand that we got uh, into the business pattern of, of, uh, of, of the business. Uh, lately, I think, if, I, if again, I echo to what uh, Assam said, that the, the brave decisions of Dubai, I think, in the past two years, I think, and opening up uh, to many events and many activities and uh, expos is, is a reflection of that, I think. It definitely, I think, that gave a confidence in, in people's mind to travel and come to Dubai and engage, I think, in terms of uh, many events that happen, I think, lately. And I think what I add to it, um, the visa policy of Dubai, I think, that uh, really opened a door to many segments of the business mm -hmm. that wasn't there. I mean, whether you talk about uh, remotely you work and come to Dubai and enjoy that, or family visas, or, uh, or maybe retiree visas, or so many of these kind of segments that Dubai created, uh, that definitely, I think, helped, I think, more businessman even to re relocate in Dubai. And we have seen that even from uh, what happened uh, during the, the war, I think, that happened between Ukraine and Russia. Many, many companies have relocated themselves in Dubai, being the safe place to, to establish themselves. I think they all added value. And we saw the benefits from MRC Line in terms of the demand that we've seen on the, the premium cabin. I think that's really an, a good match, I think, between the two. Uh, we, we have run out of time, but I do want to say one thing to, to close. Um, how, 
I want to say a couple of things. So how Skift defines innovation for us as a company is constantly coming up with new ways of looking at the world, which is it, we will fail if we don't continue to excite you about the business of travel. How do we come up with new ways of looking at the world? And I was thinking about this this morning as I was listening to, to you uh, speak at the city briefing. That is at the core, I think, of Dubai's innovation, which is the reason you, you could just stop doing all these 100 million things that you do. But one, it gives you energy internally. Two, it gives you the hooks to market the, the, the... Three, it gives people the reasons to come here. So constantly coming up with new ways of looking at the world, which is our philosophy at Skift, is very much, it looks like the philosophy of Dubai and how Dubai has been built, but Dubai and brands continue to innovate. Uh, for us, it's not tech. Tech, as you said, is just a layer. It's how do you come up with new ways of looking at the world. The last thing I'll say is, I, you know, as a Muslim that lives in the West, um, I really think this is Middle East's moment. That, like, what has happened in the last few months, what has happened with the World Cup, what's happened uh, with opening up of Saudi, all the things that are happening. Morocco, uh, as well, Adil is sitting right here somewhere. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, this was, it. We, 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 we all cried ourselves to sleep last night. Uh, New York Times had, an, had a column this morning where it said, this will forever be known as Morocco's World Cup from here on. And it should be. So. <laughs> Which is, you know, for decades, the perception of the Middle East has been what we all know. But I think all these changes that are happening, including the World Cup as well, including Morocco's story, including you, including Abu Dhabi, including everybody else in this region, um, you said it's at some times you think about the competition, but at, at, at this point, really, the competition is you. If you don't pick it up from here and sort of take it for the rest of the world, the loss is yours. So I think it's very much Middle East moments. I'm actually going to write a column on this. Um, I was in Saudi the week before. I, I saw the changes they're doing. I'm here now as well. Obviously, the World Cup as well. I want to sort of combine all those threads together to write this is Middle East moments. Um, it really is, I think, for the first time in so, 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 so many times. Anyway, that's what I wanted to end up on. So thank you for your time very much. Thank Appreciate you. Thank you.